So to find the piriformis, we start near the dimple. And we move down the posterior iliac spine to the posterior iliac spine. So that's this little bony lump here. And then if we draw a line from there to the greater trochanter and then angle the probe from 2 o'clock to 8 o'clock, you can see the piriformis muscle deep to the gluteus maximus. And then we can find an area here to measure the muscle depth and look at the echogenicity. And then that would be a good image to then use as a comparison with the other buttock. So if I was to perform a comparison, instead of 2 o'clock to 8 o'clock, Okay, so we're more like 4 o'clock to 11 o'clock. And you can put the muscles side by side. You can actually see even the peritoneum, and this is inside the abdomen, so the peritoneum's the bright white line, and then you can see the bowel peristalsis below that. So we're looking for hypertrophy, denervation, atrophy, and that's piriformis. And then the deep external hip rotators are best accessed from below, so we're going to move from most inferior to superior. So a good landmark to find initially is the ischium. So we're placing the, the camera in transverse, about 6 to 10 centimetres above the inferior gluteal fold. We can identify the ischium here and the hamstring origin here. This is the conjoint tendon and the semimembranosus more laterally and more anteriorly. And then as we move the camera out to identify the greater trochanter, which is this part, we can move a little further south and we see the bone changes shape and this is our lesser trochanter. So between the ischium and the femur, this is the ischiofemoral space or the ischial tunnel. And if we look beneath the sciatic nerve, you can see a nice big square muscle on the left buttock here, it's pointing towards 10 o'clock. And this is the quadratus femoris, great big square muscle. So we can change the shape and appearance of this muscle by internal and external hip rotation. So if we want to open up the space, we want to internally rotate the hip. So we could ask our patient to turn the toes in. So like pigeon toe. And you can see that widens the space between the ischium and the femur. And then if we externally rotate the hips so the toes point out, we're bringing the bones together and we're causing like an ischiofemoral impingement. So we can see the hamstring margin here. We can see the sciatic nerve here. And the quadratus femoris sort of bulges up here. So let's watch that move. We could actually even um, ask the patient to flex at the knee. And we could do the same thing. So I'm going to swap hands. So we flex at the knee and then we're going to bring the foot out. This is opening the space, closing the space. Keep going with that movement. And just watch the sciatic nerve movement in this view as well. You can see it sort of subluxes up and over the hamstring origin. And in this view too, we could have a look at the semimembranosus. If it's detached from the bone, avulsed from the ischium, it can sometimes sublux into that ischiofemoral space. Okay, so that's quadratus femoris. Now we're going to move on to the obturator and the gemellus. So there's two gemellus muscles and one obturator internus. So if we move superior to our quad fem, we're going to see instead of the muscle insertion pointing towards 10 o'clock, it's going to point down to 8 o'clock. And this is our inferior gemellus. You can see the sciatic nerve looking a little flatter over the top. And now if I move superiorly, the muscle disappears and we're onto an echogenic fibrilla tendon. This is the obturator internus, which has a, its own little bursa. If I move even more superior, that's superior gemellus. And you can see they all point downwards because they're tucking into the medial surface at the back of the greater trochanter. So in, to, in the longitudinal on the nerve, if we sit lateral to the ischium and just above the quadratus femoris, which is this great big muscle at the bottom, if we follow the nerve superiorly, you start to have to rotate the top of the camera towards the sacrum. 
So it's more like 1 o'clock to 7 o'clock if you're on the left buttock. And we can see black, white, black. So this hypoechoic muscle here is inferior gemellus, obturator internus, and superior gemellus. And in the normal sciatic nerve anatomy, it should dive in just above the superior gemellus. So the nerve, sciatic nerve starts on the anterior surface of the piriformis, deep in the pelvis, and comes out beneath the piriformis, and then goes straight away over the top of the superior gemellus. So we may pick up anatomic variants where we see the nerve, um, part, part of it may be coming out through the middle of the muscle belly of piriformis, or it might all originate superior to the piriformis. Um, and obviously at the sciatic nerve level, we want to see just one nerve, but occasionally you'll see a high split into its tibial and common perineal components. We can also see the inferior um, gluteal artery here. Something to be mindful of when we're performing injections of the hamstrings, the little artery over the top. Um, so now what we'll do is we'll have a look at the sciatic nerve in some dynamic movements. So first of all, we're going to ask the patient to flex at the knee. And then we're going to perform internal external rotation and have a look what happens to the nerves. So firstly, if we move into this position, this is like we're simulating an internal rotation of the hip. And you can see how the sciatic nerve develops these natural little angulations. One here between inferior gemellus and quad fem, and another little angulation at the level of the obturator internus. And then if we move the leg back, into simulated external rotation. The nerve's straightening out, but we can see a slight angulation sometimes develops again as they reach the extremes of those movements. So it's just good to know that some degree of angulation at these levels here and here is quite normal and happens in asymptomatic patients as well, as symptomatic patients. Now, if we're going to look for sciatic nerve excursion, we can do it at this point, but um, preferably not prone because we want to activate some hip flexion. So we're going to move our patient in a minute into decubitus. Before we do, I'll just do the hamstring origin in a longitudinal and a trans. So in the transverse, we angle in slightly from the lateral aspect so that we've got the posterior border of the hamstring parallel with the top of the screen, which is near impossible, but we'll get it to look nice and echogenic. And we can measure at this level and compare with the other side. The most posterior superficial component is our conjoint tendon, which forms a nice triangle. And then if we move a little more laterally and angle in from a lateral approach, slightly deeper, we can see the semimembranosus here. And if we want to see those a little better, we can also ask the patient to lift the lower leg off the table, so slight knee flexion just to act activate those muscles and relax back down and you can see it sags back. So another knee flexion, just lift a little higher this time. That's semimembranosis and back down and that's conjoint tendon there. And then if we move a good probe length superior to the ischium and rotate so that the superior end of the footprint points towards the sacrum, we bring the sacrotuberous ligament into view so I've just had to move towards the sacrum slightly. It's the sacrotuberous ligament. The neurovascular bundle passing underneath it here is pudendal nerve. And some people have a high hamstring origin, um, meaning the fibres don't just originate on the ischium. They can originate along the sacrotuberous ligament. And sacrotuberous ligament itself can be anatomically thicker on one side than the other. Um, so again, comparison's key. We can also use sacrotuberous ligament as a, a landmark to finding the gemellus and the obturator. So if we line up on the sacrotuberous ligament, you can keep your orientation the same, but just translate the probe laterally until you fall onto the sciatic nerve, which is here. And then underneath it, we're back to our dark inferior gemellus, obturator internus, and superior gemellus. So it's in the same alignment as the sacrotuberous ligament, which is more medial. So we're now going to look for sciatic nerve excursion. Um, the sciatic nerve is quite easy to find in transverse if you run up the posterior thigh. You can see it quite laterally sitting underneath biceps femoris. And if we're in the upper thigh, 
there's a nice little echogenic line which is the conjoint tendon. Um, I'll just find it for you. If we run down from our hamstring, watch the conjoint tendon distal to here forms a little echogenic vertical line. So this is where semitendinosus is merging with biceps femoris. So we're going to do sciatic nerve um, excursion. So we move from the hamstring origin laterally to identify the sciatic nerve, which is overlying quad fem. And at this level, we can also assess sciatic nerve movement. So we could um, do what we're about to do, but I'll show, I'll show it to you in longitudinal first. So if we move below the level of quad fem and identify our sciatic nerve deep to bi fem, and in front of the adductor, Magnus. And now we're going to perform hip flexion, knee extension and dorsiflexion. So I'm going to move myself into another position and use an assistant because it's important that the patient is doing some of this passively and that the knee is not adducting too far towards the table because if the knee falls towards the table that creates an internal rotation on the hip which can change the shape of the sciatic nerve. So I'm going to turn longitudinally and then if we use an assistant to support the knee so that it's not adducting towards the table. We're aiming for close to 90 degrees hip flexion but if we can only make it to 70 degrees that would be fine as well, whatever the patient can do. And then from there we dorsiflex the foot and we extend the lower leg, so extending the knee and then bending the knee again and bringing the hip back down and we do that three times so we'll try again so use your right hand to sort of help the dorsiflexion and yep and one more time so normal excursion of the nerve can be up to about 22 millimeters so definitely on the extension of the knee with the dorsiflexion you get the most out of the movement so just dorsiflexing alone is not going to produce movement. Just moving the lower leg and keeping the hip in a fixed position is not going to produce maximal excursion. So it's very important that you start from the knee, uh, sorry, the hip being extended, move it towards the abdomen, then kick out the lower leg with dorsiflexion, and you can see nice excursion of the nerve back and forth. So it's obviously very hard to do, so the patient might need to hold the table. If you've got a pillow you can put under the knee, that would be helpful if you have to scan on your own. And then we can do the same thing but a little bit higher. So in transverse we find the quadratus femoris and we're going to do exactly the same thing. So flexion, dorsiflexion and then extend the knee. Just do that a few times. So we're sitting immediately lateral to the hamstring origin. You can see there's minimal movement of the nerve in the transverse plane. And it just slides freely over the quadratus femoris and the gemelli. It can rotate on its axis. Probably need to be just a little bit lower near the hamstring. Same again. Be mindful that it's normal to get little dips in the longitudinal plane. So if we were in the longitudinal plane and their knee was to fall towards the table during the hip flexion phase, you will expect to see some more kinks in the nerve than if the knee was supported. So if the knee is supported, so there's less of that internal rotation. Now we'll just watch the nerve through various passive movements. So the assistant will be guiding the patient through a number of movements and just observe what would be normal for a nerve in a functional patient without symptoms.